Well, I think we can get started. Welcome everybody back uh, to the in-person seminar. It's been a long time. Uh, just a reminder to keep your masks on. And also uh, for the people that are on Zoom, uh, if you unmute yourself, just ask the question uh, out aloud. I don't know if anybody's on Zoom. We, on Zoom, we can't tell right now. But if people are on Zoom, just unmute and so G has no problem with interruption. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so, so it's a pleasure today to introduce Sajit. Uh, Sajit was a student at Stanford, and then after that was a postdoc at Berkeley, and then oh, Stanford, faculty, 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 faculty at Berkeley, yep, sorry, yeah. Faculty at Berkeley, and then from Berkeley, uh, he also then moved on to uh, Johns Hopkins uh, as a professor, and today he's gonna tell us about uh, all right, thank you very much. Um, so I have given this talk a couple of times. The first time I gave it, it lasted three hours and 40 minutes. So I have slimmed it down quite a bit. So I gave it the second time, it lasted two hours. So I don't know how long it'll take today, right? We'll see. Uh, so I'll give you uh, a consistent version of the full story, but perhaps it, it won't be everything, but you know, it depends on how much we discuss. So we want to modify quantum mechanics. The question you can ask is why? Why modify quantum mechanics? If you think about it, the rules of quantum mechanics were ultimately made up by a bunch of people who got together in a conference, right? It wasn't like these guys, uh, you know, like, I mean, that's just true, right? They met up in a conference and based on the observations in the uh, 1900s, uh, they came up with a set of rules and said, look, this is what the rules should be in order to make sense of the observations that they were seeing. Why should it be that these rules are absolute? Why? It's worth asking that question. And if you try to modify quantum mechanics, you can basically say, well, what are the two postulates of quantum mechanics that are out there that you might want to question? One would be probability, the other is linearity. The two things that you list in your quantum mechanics course and say, look, these are the rules. Which of these do you want to modify? You can, you can of course say that these are postulates, but in fact, they are tested to a very high precision yeah. in very many experiments. Sure. I mean, there's a reason why they came up with those rules, because they fit data. So if you want to question one of these two things, the question would be, which of these do you want to go after? There are many people who have tried to modify quantum mechanics by going after probability. Now, in my opinion, that's not something that's likely to work. And that is due to the fact that uh, there are a couple of facts about the world that are empirically true, which I will tell you heavily motivates the fact that the world will be probabilistic. The first is that if you take a finite system below any given energy level, that system has a finite set of energies. There are only a finite number of energy levels in a finite system below some fixed energy. That's a fact about the world. It's also true that the world has continuous observables and symmetries. These two facts are in contradiction to a requirement that you may impose on the physical system and say that every observable of that system always be completely deterministic. Let me give you a simple example of why these two things are not going to play well with each other. Suppose you have an electron in an atom and you ask, could this electron always have a well-defined position, right? This is the trivial solar system model of the atom that I used to have in my head as a child. So you basically say, ah, I have a proton here. There's an electron going around the proton in the hydrogen atom. And let's say you thought that was actually a well-defined energy level state of the hydrogen atom, like the earth going around the sun. You could trivially perform a rotation since the world has continuous observables and symmetries, which means if this is an eigenstate, if this is a sensible energy state of the atom, so would this point be, right? Connected by symmetry. And obviously, since rotations are a continuous set of things you can do, this obviously leads to an infinite degeneracy, which of course violates this assumption that a finite system only has a finite set of energy levels below something. Yes, sir. 
So this is a very nice argument, <clears throat> but why should observables and symmetries be continuous? I can give like a cloudless gauge theory, which is not true. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could certainly speculate on whether or not it could be the case that, uh, uh, you know, rotation and, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, translation, things of that sort are at some level discretized, mm -hmm. right? But then, it, uh, I mean, so that is an interesting question to think about. But all I'm saying is that if you believe these two statements about the world, sure. you have a contradiction. That's all. Mm -hmm. So quantum mechanics, in some sense, is a compromise between these facts, which is that essentially you sacrifice absolute determinism by basically saying that, look, I'm going to somehow preserve the statement that I have a finite set of energy states. And my belief that the world seems to have continuous symmetries and observables by sacrificing the requirement that every observable in the theory is absolutely deterministic at all times. And if you look at the various tests of quantum mechanics, such as the Bell inequalities, the token speckle theorem, the SSE theorems, the way they show that the world is different from quantum mechanics, sorry, that the world is quantum mechanical as opposed to having some hidden variable or whatever, is by basically playing off finiteness, okay, versus continuous symmetries. Like typically the Bell inequalities involve tests of angular momentum, where you will ultimately find that it comes down to the fact that if you really ask, why does the theorem work? It is because you're basically saying angular momentum states are finite, but rotation is continuous. That's the guts of the argument. Linearity. So I'm not going to go after probability, okay? I'm fine with probability. Linearity. So the linearity of quantum mechanics is a statement that the wave function does not interact with itself. So let's ask, what is a canonical example? of linearity in quantum mechanics, what's say very weird about it. The greatest example, in my opinion, is a lamb shift. So if you look at the lamb shift of hydrogen, it is coming from the following fact that the 2s and the 2p levels of hydrogen are exactly degenerate up to some QED correction. And if you think about this in a very naive picture, right, where I basically say, look, the electron going around the atom here, the proton there, oh, sorry, the electron going around the proton here, think of it as some kind of charge density, you know, that's a canonical, plausical model of the system. Uh, so you've got one charge density here, there's another charge density there. And naively you would say, look, this is a charge density, the charge density can talk to itself, there should be some kind of self energy. So you might naively expect that these two guys, one is a sphere, the other is a dumbbell, that there would be an energy shift to these two guys coming from the self-interaction, the electron's shape with itself, okay? That's what you would expect, the dumbbell and the, and the sphere, right? Some geometric difference, but that does not exist in linear quantum mechanics. But it's not like there is some fundamental reason why this shape is something you cannot see, right? If I put another electron here, that electron is very sensitive. I mean, senses the fact that this is the 2S level versus the 2P level. Because, for example, this guy will do a much better uh, uh, you know, job of screening the nuclear charge as opposed to this guy, where over here I can probably see some extra nuclear charge. So it's not like there is some reason why the shape of the electron cloud cannot be visible. Obviously, it's visible. It's just that the electron doesn't see itself. So I always thought linearity is a better thing to go after if you try to modify quantum mechanics. But the question becomes, why hasn't anyone done it? What are the challenges that one runs into in doing this? Lambshift is because the electron can't see itself. The electron yeah, is because the electron and the proton talk to each other. Well, right. It's not the electron talking to itself. So, excuse me, linearity implies that if you have an, a wave function or state in the Fox space, yes, you can always prepare a wave function uh, as a linear combination. Sure. Uh, if the states are degenerate, it's the more so. And yes. I think it's measured, it's uh, confirmed by experiment. We will talk about it in a second. We will talk about experimental tests of this scenario later in the talk. And you will find that actually, surprisingly, that uh, many of these atomic tests of uh, linearity in quantum mechanics do not, in fact, actually put real limits on actual nonlinear modifications of quantum mechanics that are also causal. So we'll see this in a second. I mean, uh, give me time. I will get to that point when we do that. But again, the, uh, at this point, we just talk about the theory, right? So what are the challenges that you worry about if you're trying to modify quantum mechanics? One issue would be causality, right? This has often been an issue in trying to come up with a causal modification of quantum mechanics. You want to think about measurement, 
How do you think about measurement in such a system? And finally, at the end of the day, our world is in fact described by quantum field theory. So that's exactly what you should be worried about. Is that a question or did I just, uh... no, I think I was just like having my own boomerang here. So, you know, um, there are plenty of examples of nonlinear theories in the classical world. It's not like nonlinearity per se has something to do with uh, causality. So if you have a canonical classical theory, the way causality is enforced is by the Green's function, right? That's basically how you make sure that I have nonlinear interactions, but the nonlinear interactions nevertheless don't violate any causal rule because any change you cause the system propagates via a causal Green's function. So here is an important point, which distinguishes what we've been trying to do with what other people have tried before. Linear quantum mechanics is basis independent. You can, you know, uh, it's linear, right? So, uh, but on the other hand, there's a fact about the world, which is that interactions in the world prefer the position basis because interactions are local. So we're gonna think about the, this fact about the world. And when you're trying to come up with a nonlinear modification, we're gonna use the position basis as our central way of looking at the world. And that will turn out to have very natural embedding in local field theory, which is one of the reasons why we're excited about this proposal. Is this uh, sort of position based? It's not obvious that this is uh, the, the preferred, right? I mean, like, interactions in the world are local, right? Interactions are, uh, and everything percolates in momentum. Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. It's just it's motivation. What, what kind of particles you're looking at? It, these are photons that are distributed in space, right? So they're, they're, they're... I mean, Maxim, I see you sit at a location, right? Uh, you... I've not seen you spread out as a wave function typically. Well, because uh, this is a specific about relativistic problems, right? So yeah. once you start... Uh... I'm just giving you motivation for why I'm formulating it the way I am. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's gonna come down from field theory and there's a natural way in field theory, this makes sense. Sorry, but uh, the expression to the Green's function is called relativistic, right? Yes. So, but the quantum mechanics is not relativistic, so how? Well, there is quantum field theory, which is relativistic, of course. Yeah, but- And uh, we are gonna come up with a theory that is actually relativistic, right? That's what the world is about. But are you going to discuss first non-relativistic? No, um, I'm gonna start with field theory directly. So there is, uh, let, 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 me, let me tell you what it is, right? Let me tell you the framework and then you can see what I'm doing. Let's just ask you this. Yes. Uh, suppose I take C to infinity. Yes. You have like well developed examples. Yeah. Self consistent on the yes. quantum mechanics. Yes. Quantum mechanics. Yes. Okay. So yes. Just give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. So the framework that I'm going to discuss in the beginning is basically embedded in field theory to start with because causality is a central issue. And it's very natural to think about causality in the concept of field theory because that's exactly where it arises in the first place. And then we'll talk about the shorting a picture of this story, which would be something like the non relativistic version. And then we will discuss causality and measurement uh, to some extent. And then we'll talk about some of these other more interesting issues. It will turn out that uh, nonlinear uh, modifications of quantum mechanics have some dramatic macroscopic effects, they turn out to be in some sense very resistant to decoherence, which makes them testable in very interesting ways. At the same time, these effects are also highly sensitive to cosmology, it turns out. And plus they're also very, very fickle in other ways. So even though they're very robust against, uh, you know, um, uh, decoherence per se, uh, they're also like very fickle, okay? And both of these issues that we are gonna discuss, discover are, they are natural parts of our story, but in my opinion, they're actually a generic feature of any kind of nonlinear attempt to modify quantum mechanics. And we will see why, oh, sorry. Uh, and then I'll discuss constraints on the scenario and, and tests as well. And then I'll talk about some future directions of this work. Framework. So I'm gonna adopt the Schrodinger picture of quantum field theory. The Schrodinger picture of quantum field theory, this is also what you do. You basically say there are some chi of t, this is some wave functional of all the quantum states of the various quantum fields. You can think about them in some Fox space. And phi of x are some time independent operators. And then you say there's a Hamiltonian, which is given by the integral over some Hamiltonian density of the field and its conjugate momentum. 
And the time evolution that you solve for is still Schrodinger's equation, I d chi dt is equal to h chi. That's also the, the solution that you're trying to do in linear quantum field theory. That's what you're doing. Relativistic quantum field theory, you still solve Schrodinger's equation. It's just that, that your Hamiltonian is now a function of these operators. So I will make a little bit of a slight detour here and point out that this time evolution equation can be derived from this simple action. This is not a deep point I'm making. It just makes my life a little bit easier when we discuss the nonlinear uh, things I can, I'm trying to do. And uh, you know, nobody talks about it this way because in the linear theory, it doesn't actually give you anything new. So, but notice that I can look at this particular action where these are the quantum state sky and uh, this is the Hamiltonian density sitting in there. And basically, if I think about this particular action and I say that, look, my variables that I'm trying to solve for are the quantum state sky themselves. If I go through the Euler Lagrange procedure and say, the, me, why do you get, why do you use uh, both Brian Kent states? Well, I want to get a number out of it. The, ah, this, you are writing the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian, exactly. Right, exactly. So if I minimize the path of minimum action here, that'll give me the Schrodinger equation, right? That's just true. So let's think about what this looks like for a Yukawa theory. This is an example. The Yukawa theory, of course, the interesting term is interaction term. And that is a statement that I take my Hamiltonian and I add some Yukawa coupling to it. Phi of X, Psi bar, Psi of X. What does my action look like in this case? The action will now contain, is the same action as before, of course. The Hamiltonian density now contains these extra terms. So if I expand that out, if I just write that out, the Hamiltonian, uh, that lives in here, the entire action contains terms of this kind, right? There is a, uh, the sky H chi is basically contains this term. Okay, the Yukawa coupling phi psi bar psi. I haven't said anything new here. For the last 100 years, we've been doing quantum field theory where we have no problem adding a variety of higher order operators here and going and looking for them. All of those are sensible things we do. These are of course, uh, non-linear in the operators, if you will, but in the states, they're of course linear. So obviously that's a very sensible thing to do. We have no problem doing that, good. But this way of writing down the theory allows you to think about how you could introduce a nonlinear modification that is state dependent. Where now you say, look, the um, action that gives rise to the Schrodinger equation didn't just contain that one term that you've been playing around with for so long, but there are other ways for me to introduce a number in the story because the only rule about this action is that, you know, these size are operators or matrices or whatever. These, the chi's are of course states, they're vectors. I need to get a number to define my action. And so think about the fact that I can take this particular object and with an epsilon introduce another number here, but I basically say, instead of this being chi, phi, psi bar, psi, chi, I could make it as chi, phi, chi, Chi, psi bar, psi, uh, psi bar, psi, chi, right? Excuse There's me. There's also a number, I, yes. I don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. You write linear QFT. Why yes. you sandwich the Lagrangian term, phi psi by psi, which is the cover term? Why do you need to, to sandwich between chi, chi of Well, I'm, uh, notice that I am- The expectation value of this operators over some specific state. Right? Yes. We, we don't do that in field theory. No, in field theory, you don't actually, this is not the standard field theory action, notice, right? This action, if I find the path of minimum action in chi, gives me the Schrodinger equation. And you agree that- in, You are using the Schrodinger equation in the quantum field theory. Which you do, yes. It's hopeless. No. Yeah, because it's infinitely dimensional. In fact, it's infinitely dimensional system. You agree that in quantum field theory also, we solve I d chi d t equal to h chi. Field theory is functional equation. It's not- You can also- Dimensional equation. You, no, no, no. In quantum field theory also, you are indeed solving Schrodinger's equation. I d chi d t equal to h chi, right? Yes, it's much more complicated. H is infinite dimensional. Chi is, you know, very, uh, also an infinite dimensional thing. I don't doubt the fact that that's true, but at the end of the day, you are indeed solving I d chi d t equal to h chi. Excuse me. May yes. I ask you the last question? I yes. won't bother you again. Yes. Are you going with this expression, what you call the action? Actually, it's not the standard. Value. It's not the standard action. Yeah. Are you going to 
get some practical results or it just for philosophical reasons. It allows me to easily introduce a nonlinearity. In this way, and you so will see. Let's start with linear. Linear, yes. standard linear. If you, case. If you take them. You get from the Schrodinger picture any single practical measurable result in that. Are you telling me that if I take if I take the Schrodinger equation and solve it, if I this is like the please an example. I don't need words, right? An effect or a, uh, the time evolution of particles scattering can be computed in the Schrodinger picture. Are you denying that fact? No, how that's all. So I'm not. Are you telling me that you cannot calculate how particles scatter no, in a Yukawa theory? Calculate, but not from the Schrodinger picture and quantum field theory. You do. Are you telling me that the Schrodinger equation is wrong? To calculate. Are you telling me the Schrodinger equation is wrong the to solve scattering? You need. You need to do what some people call it's historical second quantization. Yes. And uh, then. You can do the scattering, and if you have to involve the loop, it's even more complicated. I don't deny that it's complicated. If you okay, start from the standard linear Schrodinger. I am equation. giving you. Functional. I am giving That's you. Me. I am giving you the statement that the Schrodinger equation is correct. Schrodinger that it does, in fact, solve the correct thing. Absolutely. It may be more complicated. I don't doubt that. Schrodinger equation is correct. One then. Do we want to change it? It is certainly correct. Yeah. In field theory, nobody ever managed to use it for any practical calculation. It's only for maybe for some symmetry consideration. Is it a correct equation of field theory? It's abstract field theory. It is correct equation of field theory, right? It's, it's correct, but it's That's a all. functional equation. You cannot deal with the functional equation. I am not telling you how to calculate something specific yeah. with that okay then it's philosophy okay okay I understand. Thank okay you. and then you now have your nonlinear action right which is the statement that i can now take this particular theory i can put in the chi's in the middle over here and that gives me another action this is not the standard action of quantum field theory uh, but it is something i can define what this is is higher order in states, not in the operators. So what you can now do is you can take this particular action, find the path of minimum action, which will now give you a modification of the Schrodinger equation, which is something you can again use to do quantum field theory. And we're gonna simply analyze this theory. Uh, I'm gonna analyze this nonlinearity perturbatively. So, yes. The cubic term in what? Ah, yeah. So the reason why I do it this way is because when you get it from this action, it's easy to con construct conserved quantities, like uh, conserved energies and stuff like that. Right? Because uh, if you put in random terms, you might worry do the random terms give rise to conserved energy functions. And uh, deriving it from this action makes it clear that you can actually construct such quantities. But, but the first non trivial term would be cubic. Uh, well, in a sense, like this is my non-trivial term that I'm putting in here, right? So that's what it is. Can, can you go back to the slide? Yes. So, so does it mean that you insert just some kind of density operator here? Density operator? No, I'm just. I mean, that's my state. Yeah, but then so when, when you when you write this chi chi, yeah, this one. This, this yes. Thing. So that's an expectation value that I'm taking. So that's just a number multiplying another number. Yeah, but if you if you compare with Linear case two, right? Yes. So you add these two new chi's. Yes. But you do not integrate over. Uh, yeah, exactly, because that would be a triviality, right? This kind of density. I mean, uh, that's what I'm doing here. So. Yeah, you. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you, uh, you. You can call that the density state row. If you, if that, that's what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. My trick is just that. Basically. All I know about this quantity is that this needs to be a number, and I'm giving you new ways to get numbers in that action. But then we can probably understand it just in terms of, yeah, like field theory, no. equilibrium system, no. where you integrate something out. No. Okay. 
So if you look at, uh, so what we're saying is the fact that now if I want to understand what the uh, change to the Schrodinger equation is, right? The change to the Schrodinger equation is that usually you had a Y phi psi bar psi. That was a standard term that you'd put in the, you know, in the Hamiltonian. Now you've got this extra term, this epsilon chi psi bar psi, sorry, epsilon phi chi, that term in there. And you're still solving the same equation as before, is I d chi dt equal to h chi, is that your, uh, the only point is that the h contains this extra piece here, which is this field dependent, state dependent piece. That's the main difference, okay? So how do you think about this theory? Of course, at order epsilon equal to zero, this is just standard quantum field theory. Uh, nothing unusual has happened just yet. And uh, if you want to compute the first order correction, you simply take your zeroth order states that you calculated, and you take your zeroth order solutions, you plug that in over here, that tells you what the correction to the Hamiltonian is from the, uh, you know, first, from the zeroth order piece. That of course allows you then to go and calculate what the first order correction to the state should be, right? So in doing that calculation, Basically, you're simply just saying that the, uh, this particular quantity, chi, phi, chi, more or less acts as a, simply as a background field. That's really all that is actually happening. So now you can perform standard QFT evolution on this background field, and you can use this to compute uh, your first order correction. You can do that. Give, having given you that idea, you can also see how one might int introduce this in the path integral formalism. Because once again, all you'll be doing is a statement that at zeroth order, you go and calculate whatever you need to calculate, the standard quantum field theory thing, right? And then you're basically going to insert this quantity as a background field in your path integral to calculate the second order correction, sorry, the first order correction to the theory. And this of course applies to all orders because uh, essentially the statement is that to compute a term of given order, you obviously only need terms of lower order and terms of lower order can always be calculated in this particular way and therefore, uh, and all the lower order terms only enter as background fields, and thus you can perturbatively describe the evolution of this theory in a completely consistent ma manner. And then it looks like the mean field theory. Also. There are elements of this that look like mean field theory, but the fact is, once I've made this state dependent in this way, there are also distinct new effects that I'll, I'll tell you in just a second what they are, okay? I'll just make a brief comment about causality. Uh, if you're interested, I'm ha I have a bunch of slides to discuss this in greater detail. But the main idea is the following, right? The nonlinearity only enters via some expectation value. And of course, at lowest order, the way you calculate that, of course, is causal from quantum field theory. And uh, so if you're trying to, what you'd worry about is that if I try to do something here and there, is it possible for me to induce some kind of highly nonlinear, say, highly acausal behavior? Well, at zeroth order, you basically know that the evolution of the expectation value is causal. So nothing unusual happens. You're going to take that causal quantity, put that in there to calculate the next order piece, which of course obeys the standard rules, which will again give you only a causal evolution. And thus you end up getting a causal uh, evolution to all orders. It is possible to introduce this not just for uh, the Yukawa coupling. One can also do this for other interactions like gauge theories, where basically if you look at some interaction of this form, A mu, J mu, Notice that if I write a mu as a mu plus epsilon chi a mu chi, or I, I just divided by chi chi in order to do some normalization. The simple fact over here is that both these guys, this field a mu and b mu, this dummy field that I created, they of course both have the same gauge transformations. And therefore, once you write down a term of this form, say e a mu j mu, you know that becomes gauge invariant. You can just replace a mu by b mu since the gauge transformations are the same, you end up getting a gauge invariant theory. Yes. So you haven't said what the state chi is. And it's the state of all quantum fields. But, okay, good, fine. So uh, how would you calculate the expectation value of chi in that state? Be well, given, uh, good. So uh, there's, a, there's a question of your, uh, uh, the Cauchy problem, right? Like how do you, what, what information do you need? So basically you would say at time t equals zero, whatever it is, I have, I'm giving you some initial state chi, right? Once I give you some initial state chi, you can then, I mean, apply the standard rules which tell you chi, phi, chi, right? Given a quantum state, the expectation value of that state is of course an observable. You just calculate that using standard quantum field theory. Just a bet. Just a bet. Standard bet. Yes. Yes. I can ask a question about causality. So you said that the ground state is causal 
and if the ground state is causal, then causality is preserved perturbatively, right? Yes. But the fact that the ground state is causal, is it an assumption? Or? No, it comes from the fact that at epsilon, at order epsilon equal to zero, right? This is standard quantum field theory. So the main point here is the fact that if I'm trying to do something a causal to the system, I would have to start by changing the expectation value in quantum field theory in an a causal way, which I cannot do. The vacuum, so, so you're saying that the vacuum is the same in this theory yes. and in the standard theory. Correct. It's the same in post the vacuum, the same plane waves. Uh, yes. But back, I don't think that the vacuum state uh, provides you a test for causality because by definition in the ground state, nothing is excited. Yes. There is no propagating symbol, signal. Okay. So to say that in the ground state, something is causal or a causal. I don't see any meaning in that. But, suppose, but once you create a particle, once you create a particle, you can, of course, talk about causality. Yeah. And once you create a particle and you can compute the expectation value, you can just ask in quantum field theory, is it possible for me to change the expectation value in an a causal way? I mean, if there are of course two, not. If there are two states, then you can compare, right? Correct. If, if this ground state would be different. No, no, chi is, now the, is not a ground state, right? It's basically a particle that you created. Is your world. So it's not the vacuum, obviously, because then nothing interesting is going on in the world. So we're basically saying, yeah, it's you and me. We are the quantum fields living in there. And uh, we basically say, yeah, take these states and uh, let me do something. Let me go there and move this uh, whatever and see if I can change the expectation value of phi in some A causal way. I cannot do that, of course. So the answer to my question was no. You're not calculating a web. You're not doing it in the vacuum state. You're doing it in some random. Oh, sorry, it's not a web. It's just yeah, it's in the current state of the theory. Sorry, yeah, it is just a chi means like you and me sitting in here. We are in a quantum state, correct? So you're computing. Uh, yeah, I mean it's not the web. It's not the vacuum expectation value. It is the expectation value of the field in the quantum state that the universe is in. And just to check, you're assuming that turning on this epsilon thing does not change the actual vacuum state. The actual vacuum state is empty. Yes, exactly. Is that obvious? Well, because if chi is the vacuum that you put in, the expectation value of phi in the vacuum is zero, assuming this is a field that doesn't have a web otherwise. But, so but then the term is zero. Hmm? It would have a web. And then... Well, let it have a web. So then the particles you'll be talking about will be fluctuations. And you can go through the analysis again, right? So the fluctuations are, so, so at that point, you talk about the fluctu the, the uh, the fluctuations become your new particles, the Higgs fields or whatever. And uh, they, of course, start at zero, right? And so anything you're trying to change the web over there will once again just have to do with the fact that you're trying to change the expectation value of a field and the expectation value of a field in QFT cannot be changed a Okay, so, so what's the Question. Yes. Can causality be violated non-perturbatively? <laughs> well, I mean, um, I don't see how in the sense that basically the only way you can violate something in this theory, right? Is a statement that something, I mean, uh, well, we only have kind of like a perturbative argument overall for the entire theory. So if you're asking like other effects that are e to the minus one, I mean, I don't see where they could arise from. No, but can I think of another uh, kind of state which I can think of as a ground state, but which disappears in the limit epsilon going to zero. Uh, I can't think of such a state. I haven't proven it, but I don't see any obvious reason why such a state should really exist. Okay. Uh, you can again play the same game for gravitation as well, where you basically take G mu nu, for example, the metric operator, and replace the metric by this expectation value sitting in there. And once again, these two guys have the same tensor transformations. So essentially, if you try to write down a gauge invariant Lagrangian for gravitation, you write that instead of G mu nu, you write that to G tilde mu nu, and you will basically see that things work out. Yes. Yeah. What's the perturbator for this guy? Well, perturbatively, you can calculate it, right? Because it's a statement that this is just a, just a background web now. That's it. I wouldn't call it a web. It's just an expectation value in whatever quantum state you're in. Yes. Yes, because the only way you will change anything here is for this guy to become a causal in the first place. Okay. And that's just not possible. Sorry, I missed it. What's the last equation? Ah, so I'm just simply saying here that if I, let's say, I want to understand. So I told you how I can introduce nonlinearity in Yukawa theories. 
And the prescription is, can you do this for gravitation? And well, I mean, you can do it in a gauge invariant manner where you look at some Lagrangian for gravity, which you normally write in terms of g mu nu and you know, multiplying by d mu phi, whatever it is. So I'm saying, oh, uh, here's a way for, me to, for you to take that gravitational Lagrangian that you're used to, and you can just put in this g tilde, which is this combination. And notice that these two things are the same tensor properties. And therefore you end up getting a gauge invariant way to introduce state dependence in that evolution. But yes. This, this looks like a field redefinition. It is not. It's not. No, you will see that, there, that it is because of the fact that it depends on the state. So there, yeah, you can call it a state dependent field redefinition. That's true. But the fact that it depends upon the state is what makes it nonlinear. Yes. About the, the, the gauge, uh, gauge there. Uh, if phi is a gauge invariant state, like a local state, then the expectation value of a on the state should be zero. I think. No, it depends upon what the state is. If it's a gauge invariant state, then how can you have a gauge variant quantity like a unless you're gauge invariant? Well, you agree that uh, once you pick a gauge. Outside the vacuum. Yeah. But in the vacuum, like you would. Violate Lorentz invariance, right? But outside of that, gauge, if chi is gauge invariant, the expectation value of A is arbitrary because it's in our mind. A is in our mind, not in nature. If A is by itself is not measurable. Yeah, it, it's just you couple it to other quantities to make the overall term gauge invariant. That's what you always do, right? And uh, well, the point is that something which is not gauge invariant does not belong to the, our Fox, our old Fox. Sure, state. sure. So your definition when the expectation value of a mu is taken is meaningless. Well, you can still, you, I mean, the correct way to say this would be the fact that to talk about any of this particular stuff for gauge theories, you need to fix a gauge, right? I don't need to on a lattice. Do I fix a gauge no, on no, the lattice? I just, just don't listen, use just listen, gauge variant right? operator. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the, maybe a more sensible way of saying this would be the statement that like, you can take your Lagrangian, whatever Lagrangian that you, that you have in there, and you can put in gauge fixing terms, just like you need to do in order to define your actual path integral, for example. It's not, no, no. And the lattice. You do the path integral without any gauge condition. So you can do it that way and you end up getting a quantity that makes sense. There's another thing you could also do, which is like, I didn't go through this particular story there, where you can just put an expectation value of F mu and you directly as well and do the same thing. Sorry, can I ask the last question? Yes. I'm a bit confused about what phrase the curvature solution of this. Ah, right? yes. So, I mean, usually, what you do, you consider small fluctuations. Right, G mu, G mu plus H mu, and uh, H mu is the curvature, right? And That's not what I mean here. I just mean the fact that I'm going to think about the uh, uh, how the how the dynamics depends upon epsilon perturbatively. Not that I'm going to talk with the graviton per se. I'm just giving you the fact that I can take a gravitational action, do this replacement. Okay, so G mu here is a full metric. So it's, a, it's the actual metric operator. Yes, yes, yes. By the way, what about general covariance? Uh, well, that's a metric. The metric transforms as it showed as a tensor. Oh, no, what, what, is, what is G in sandwich between chi? What do you have? Do you have an expectation value of a metric right now over here when we're talking? Chi is X dependent, right? Chi is, chi depends upon the state. Oh, how do you check the- Chi depends upon the state. Excuse me. May I ask a question? You can ask a question. You're right, the answer on the whiteboard. Do you agree? Do you, do you agree that right now in our world really there's an expectation value that? of the metric? I want to ask first the question. No. Do you agree that there is actually an expectation value of a metric right here? Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So the question now becomes the following. Right? We have this particular modification that we put in, and we want to understand how a particle will evolve because of this. What does this actually do in order to change how a particle will actually evolve? Again, to zeroth order, psi just sources the phi field, right? That's all it does. So we know what it does. And I can go ahead and straightforwardly go and compute the expectation value of the field in that particular state, okay? So let's just see what that actually does. What does that look like? So if I think about this particular state as 
some wave function being distributed in position. I can compute the expectation value of chi over there. And that will just simply be this particular expression here. Because all we are saying is the fact that when I compute this expectation value, there's a psi star psi. And that psi star psi is some charge density. And given that particular charge density, I can compute the expectation value that just simply looks like this Green's function living in there. And what's important here is that there's going to be this causal Green's function that lives out there, which will maintain causality at all times. All right. So um, let's put that in and see what kinds of naive physical effects you might actually expect. And uh, one thing you will notice instantly is the fact that when we introduce these terms, right, the specific nature of what lives in here, it specifically depends upon what the actual theory is. So the Yukawa theory contains this kind of expectation value. If you had 5-4 theory, that would be a different kind of expectation value that lives in there. Right? So the specific nature of what goes on in the Schrodinger picture that you, when you do this depends upon the actual quantum field theory in, in which you actually introduce a nonlinearity. So to tell you how this is different from regular quantum mechanics and why is this not some mean field sort of uh, statement here, what we're actually seeing is that if I take a particle, for example, with say a fixed central particle, right? I put a proton at the core of something and I have an electron and say the electron talks to itself, uh, well, that the, the electron has a Yukawa interaction. What you will now find is that if you compute the energy of the state, okay, uh, uh, with the self interaction term put in there, you're gonna find that the 2S and 2P levels of this hydrogenic system will no longer be degenerate. There will be a self interaction of the wave function that breaks the degeneracy of these lines. And that is a statement about this thing actually being nonlinear. You can verify that this conserves all the standard things you would like to be conserved, right? There will be a Hermitian form of the Hamiltonian. If you can look at the, oh, sorry, if you can look at what that looks like. The Hermitian form of the Hamiltonian here maintains probability conservation, that this has a conserved norm, stuff like that. And you're therefore able to retain a probabilistic interpretation of this full system. So pretty much everything else that you normally like about quantum mechanics directly ports over in here, because whatever state dependence I've included essentially maintains the Hermitian structure of the Hamiltonian. So let's briefly make a comment about how you would describe entangled states. So this was a problem that uh, uh, Weinberg encountered when he tried to modify quantum mechanics back in the past. So you take your state, and I'm thinking about a particle that is at position X and another particle that's at position Y. And you can write this particular state as a linear combination of uh, you know, some entangled states, this guy and that guy, two different coordinates X and Y. And you basically ask, right? When I perform some local operation on uh, X, for example, how will it change how Y behaves, right? That's the kind of causality issue that you're really trying to talk about. So at the end of the day, this comes down to the question of how do multi-particle systems evolve in this particular way? And here, there's no reason to guess how it's supposed to be, uh, uh, evolve because field theory just tells you what it's supposed to be. So I know that the modification I'm putting in is basically chi phi chi. That's the expectation value of the state. And you can simply compute that, right? In, in using standard quantum field theory at the, at the zeroth order. And what you're gonna find is basically that in quantum field theory at zeroth order, essentially this term looks like this. It becomes a sum of Green's functions. Green's functions take you from the point X to the point X1. So, you know, uh, my state has got X and Y. And if I'm asking how does my nonlinearity basically affect the evolution of this guy, you basically say, look, I'm going to integrate over this full quantum state, which is an X and Y. So those are my coordinates X1 and Y1 in there. And basically, I'll now have Green's functions that go from X1 to X, X1 to Y, Y1 to X, and Y1 to Y. Very standard Green's functions that tell you how things happen. So the main point of this story is the fact that you need to notice that this actually is what was considered additive in the sense that if you have a, a two-particle system with X and Y, you basically notice that the way this nonlinearity is acting on this is the statement that uh, 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 it's sort of like additive, right? It, it's particle A talking to A, particle A talking to B, plus particle B talking to A, plus particle B talking to particle B. It's got an additive form to it. Yes? I'm really confused. You're talking about paired states, and it's not here as a functional, right? Uh, so this is the single particle quantum mechanics picture. So maybe you missed that previous slide. 
But I basically said, let's look at what these effects look like in single particle quantum field theory. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So uh, this additive form was something that Polchinski noticed was necessary to maintain causality in nonlinear quantum mechanics. So the story of this goes that Weinberg back in the day had suggested a nonlinear modification of quantum mechanics, and Polchinski found that the specific modification that Weinberg had suggested was actually a causal. Right? He found an error in it, uh, and that is because Weinberg had to come up with a way in which his single particle nonlinear quantum mechanics would generalize to multi-particle quantum mechanics, and he made a mistake in making that statement. Polchinski realized that that mistake could be fixed if these nonlinear uh, modifications acted in this additive form. Okay, and what we find is that that structure naturally pops out of field theory. What about measurement? Okay, um, well, measurement is not some mysterious process in quantum mechanics. It's often taught that way, unfortunately. But in reality, we understand measurement very well, right? Measurement is simply the statement that there's some interaction between a quantum state and some measuring device. And we take some quantum state, for example, maybe there's a spin in some direction, and there is some measuring apparatus. All you're doing in measurement is that you're bringing these two guys together. You're allowing some interaction to exist between them. And interaction will, of course, do what Hamilton in evolution lets you do, which is that it lets you evolve as alpha spin up, for example, and this thing goes that way, beta spin down like that, right? That's just Hamilton in evolution, yes, sir. But, but interaction is a unitary process. And it is. is not. Measurement is a unitary process. No, it's not. It's it is. Wave function. No. Collapse of the wave function is not a unitary process. Exactly. So how can measurement be an interaction? Ah, it is because of the fact that uh, in this particular picture, this is goes with a terrible name of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. It is, in fact, not an interpretation of quantum mechanics. It is, in fact, a prediction of quantum mechanics. And that is a particular system where, if you think about measurement that way, there is no non-unitarity. No, but if I'm the measure... collapse of the wave function is something that I would say is outside of quantum mechanics because it requires exactly as you're saying a violate a deviation away from unitarity. So that's in fact the next step, slide, right? This is a prediction of quantum mechanics. You bring two objects together, they will have Hamiltonian evolution. Hamiltonian evolution, exactly as you're saying, is unitary. So you can't really have non-unitary processes in quantum mechanics. It is true that if you look at this particular story, right? What actually happens, in, uh, if you're not familiar with this way of thinking about it, is a statement that you take this particular spin, say, and you bring it in contact with some measuring device. You have unitary time evolution, which will take this particular state, put that in this complicated linear superposition. That's a true statement. What is further true, right? Is that because this is now a macroscopically entangled state, it is a situation that if you happen to be in this particular state, it is difficult for you to, understand, to access the other parts of the wave function because these are macroscopic states that are very easily orthogonal to each other. That is the reason why you effectively view the world as having collapsed the wave function, though in reality, the system is completely unitary. And this is important because this will be central to our story of understanding nonlinear quantum mechanics. Okay? And you know, uh, unfortunately, when we teach quantum mechanics, we still bring in these uh, ridiculous ideas like wave function collapse which actually make no sense. Uh, and that does confuse people quite, quite often. So you're gonna say that these worlds are actually- uh, That's right. That's correct. That's exactly right. So the way we think about measurement properly in quantum mechanics is that we would now say, well, I have reduced it all down to the state, some statement about the measuring device. That's all it is. And to make a good measuring device, what you actually do is that you basically say, look, I'm gonna look at the, uh, spectrum of this uh, measuring device, and I'm going to pick states in the, uh, and I'm going to pick the Hamiltonian. You go pick the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is such that when these two guys interact, you will evolve in this, uh, into these orthogonal states. Okay? As long as you do that, you've got a good measuring device. That's the right way to think about measurement in quantum mechanics. We're going to do exactly the same thing in nonlinear quantum mechanics too. I don't want to change anything about it at all. I'm going to allow for a general interaction between the state and the measuring device. This is just simply Hamiltonian evolution. Of course, it's nonlinear Hamiltonian evolution, but so what? It's still Hamiltonian evolution, which will then, in general, give me a superposition of these particular states. That's what's gonna happen. There is, however, a big difference between nonlinear quantum mechanics and linear quantum mechanics, because in linear quantum mechanics, 
the Hamiltonian is independent of the quantum state, of course, that's the whole point. So in order to create a nice measuring device, all you have to know are the states of the system you're trying to measure and the states of the measuring device. As, long, as soon as you know the states, you can come up with the appropriate Hamiltonian by, by plugging them together, by coming up with the appropriate matrix elements. There's no problem there. So in linear quantum mechanics, it's trivial for you to come up with a very, very good measuring device. In the nonlinear case, this is not possible because notice that my Hamiltonian, which actually governs interaction between these two systems, also depends upon the state itself. That's just part of what nonlinearity does for you, which means I cannot guarantee, right? Given, of course, given a state that I know what it is, I can, of course, construct a Hamiltonian that maintains this time, this type of evolution. But if I gave you an independent state that I didn't know what the state was about, that's what I was trying to measure. So if I gave you a random state, the Hamiltonian that couples that random state to your measuring device depends upon the state itself. And thus, in general, I cannot guarantee that I will evolve in some nice superposition where the state of the system is faithfully correlated with the state of the measuring device. You will in general have some kind of error. All right, I keep doing this. You'll, have, you'll pick up some unavoidable terms on this side, which I would call our measuring errors in a sense of this fundamental no error in the notion of measurement, right? Simply because your measuring device depends upon what's being measured. So that's just true. But I'm gonna adopt this point of view, right? That this is all measurement actually is. It's interaction between these two states. It, it gives rise to this very horrible uh, linear combination and uh, live with it. Doesn't this uh, affect the Bell inequality? Well, let's, I'll come to experimental constraints and tests later on. We'll talk about what has been tested and why it's difficult to, well, it's both easy to test and difficult to test in some ways. Okay. Sorry, that state, capital A, does it have to be macroscopic? Or it, doesn't it doesn't really matter. So measurement is just any interaction. Any interaction. That's right. Yeah, and why do you call it noise? It's also Sorry. not noise. It's the... Well, it's not noise. I mean, like, maybe noise is the wrong word. So what, what it will do is that basically sometimes your measuring device will say this, but the actual state is something else. It's deviation from prediction of linear exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it's more like I would say it's error in the sense that like the measuring device is not faithfully telling you what the other thing is. That's all. So now comes the part where things are going to sound a little crazy. Okay, and uh, uh, the craziness is not actually due to me. It's not even due to my theory. It's rather due to quantum mechanics itself, and the fact that I am required in the story to obey quantum mechanics, which is a statement that measurement and entanglement, et cetera, are actually unitary processes. So let's look at some of the crazy macroscopic effects that happen on this wall. So take a spin, prepare the spin along the X direction. You are an experimentalist. You have with you a laser and you've got two photo detectors, one of them to the right, one of them to the left, sorry, to the top that way, okay? You now take the initial state over here. And uh, this, of course, initial state of the theory, it represents the full quantum state, the spin, the experimentalist, the laser, the electromagnetic field, everything. Your goal is now to create a macroscopic superposition, which is actually trivial to do. All you're going to do as an experimentalist is stand there and measure the spin and you're gonna see if the spin comes along the, y, along the y direction. That's what you're going to do, right? And depending upon the outcome of the spin, you wanna send this laser along different directions. So this is still linear quantum mechanics. I'm not doing anything non-linear yet. So let's see what the experiment looks like. I, as an experimentalist, measured the spin along x. I got, you know, uh, uh, sorry, the spin is along x. I wanna measure it along y. Let's say I got spin up. If I get spin up, I'm gonna send the laser to the top. If I get spin down, I'm gonna send laser to the right. So the final state as per linear quantum mechanics is a superposition of this laser going to the top. That is this state, let's say, that, that basically says spin came up, the laser went to the top. And this is an environment over here that got coupled to the fact that the laser hit that guy. And on this side, this is spin going down, the laser went to the right, and I got coupled to some environment also talking over there, okay? So both those states are created the moment you actually measure the spin. 
Okay, prediction of quantum mechanics. Not even nonlinear quantum mechanics. This is linear quantum mechanics. All right. So now you can ask this question: In this experiment, which of these photodetectors will light up? Right. We all know the answer, of course. In that, in the world where you saw spin up, that photodetector lights up. In the world where you saw spin down, that photodetector lights up. Formally, the reason why that happens is because you go and compute some transition matrix element, right? Your operator is E A mu psi bar gamma mu psi. This is what it is. And uh, uh, you can go and compute this uh, transition matrix element. And when you compute this transition matrix element, the reason why, let's say, in this world where the laser went to the top, right? If you try to compute the value of the electromagnetic field to the right over here, you're going to compute this transition matrix element. And what you're going to find is basically that, oh, I take this inner product, right, of the overall state with me being, you know, spin up and laser on the top or whatever. And that inner product, of course, goes to zero, which is why formally in the world where spin went up, that laser is hot. Sorry, that photodetector is hot and that one is cold. That's actually what you're calculating. But notice that the quantum state, right, is not one of these universes. That's stupid, right? That's not unitary. That's the disappearing interpretation of quantum, the, dis the disappearing world's interpretation of quantum mechanics. Both the entire state exists. I measured the spin, spin up, I did X, spin down, I did Y. Both those states simultaneously exist. Otherwise, the theory would not be unitary. Linear quantum mechanics would not be unitary. So now let me go and calculate the expectation value of the electromagnetic field in that state. The expectation value of the electromagnetic field at both the top and the right is non-zero in both these worlds, right? Because, you know, in one part of the world, the photon went there. So what you will now see is that if I now introduce my state dependent modification, which is a statement that I'm going to couple this current to this expectation value, I'm now going to find that in both these worlds, right? This expectation value is non-zero, which means in both these worlds, what's going to happen is that here the laser went up. And in linear quantum mechanics, this photodetector should be cold, but here I'm going to find it to be epsilon times hot. Right? That says what happens. So this is communication between the worlds, or rather it allows the state to talk to itself. Right? That's what it is. It's a, um, fundamentally, you can think of this as a consequence of causality, actually. It's actually a point that Polchinski made when he proposed his correct way of thinking about nonlinear quantum mechanics is that he said, anytime I write down the term the way I wrote it, I'm going to find that it's possible for me to allow communication between my walls. Okay. It is weird, but it's not something that's fundamentally, you know, uh, violates some rules of logic or something. It's weird, of course, for sure. And the reason why this actually happened is because of the additive nature of my nonlinearity, right? In the additive nature of the nonlinearity, essentially I had to trace over one of the degrees of freedom always when I was computing this thing. And it is that trace that actually removes all the decoherence that normally causes, that normally prevents this sort of communication from existing. Okay. So this is the reason why this effect is distinct from any uh, mean field approach that you might think. Such a thing would never happen in any mean field theory or whatever. This is a distinctly different nonlinear quantum mechanical effect. But these modifications are also, it turns out, to be extraordinarily cosmologically sensitive. Right? So, one point I want to make is that you know, uh, the effect I talked about is specific to my theory. Right? I particularly put in this kind of nonlinearity, and that's what we actually tested. Uh, sorry, that's what we're actually trying to test and stuff. But the fact that there is communication between uh, uh, two worlds, right? That's a fairly generic feature of any time you try to create a nonlinear modification of quantum mechanics, as Polchinski pointed out. We're just saying that in field theory, there's a very natural way this lives very, in, a, in, a, in a very sensible way. The second thing I'm going to talk about is that even though these effects are highly resistant to decoherence, they're also extremely finicky to cosmology and even to crazy things about humanity. So we'll see about that in a second. But again, all of this comes largely from just quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's take this simple example. You know, this is my linear quantum mechanics. This is a nonlinear term that I'm adding. And let us say that the state of the universe 
is some alpha times our world plus beta times the multiverse. Okay, the multiverse, I just mean it's some totally different universe. Not us at all, it's something completely different. Okay, some crazy, crazy quantum state. In linear quantum mechanics, you never care what the value of alpha is, right? You are in your world, you just go around doing your experiment, you don't care that there's a multiverse out there or whatever, it doesn't matter to you. Why? It's because in linear quantum mechanics, it is the case that if, you know, uh, chi satisfies the Schrodinger equation, so does alpha chi, right? The weight of the wave of the state doesn't matter. You get the same physical effects, no matter what alpha is. But if you look at the nonlinear term, this is the only term that's allowed that you can write down. In fact, this is true of any nonlinearity, right? It depends on the state itself. Notice that this expectation value, chi a mu chi, is now alpha squared u a mu u, but this is your universe. And, the, 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 and then picks up a piece beta squared, which from the multiverse. Now here's the crucial point, okay? The experiment I talked about, where I turned on a spin, depending upon whether or not the spin went up or down, the laser goes to the left or the right, all those kinds of things. I was controlling local fields in my world, okay? So the contribution of the local fields that I'm doing in my world are always going to get weighed down by alpha squared. I can't avoid that fact, okay? So if it is the case that whoever created the universe for some reason best known to that person made our world alpha extremely small, very tiny, okay? All of these nonlinear effects that I'm talking about would be incredibly suppressed. So the local exploitability, what you can go in your lab and actually physically do, which comes down to the fact that you go there and you turn a laser on and measure some field, in nonlinear quantum mechanics, those are suppressed by what fraction of the wave function you are physically in. This is different from linear quantum mechanics, but alpha does not matter. So this is a very important point, right? It may explain why quantum mechanics we feel is fundamentally linear just because you happen to be in a very, very unfortunate superposition. You could try to play this game. Is it possible for you to somehow boost these nonlinear effects? Because it's roughly what you do in a linear theory. You're sort of like, well, well, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, let me just condition myself to having been in this particular world and therefore I can ignore what alpha is. We talk about it that way, but in fact, that is not the reason why linear quantum mechanics, uh, you don't care about alpha. Fundamentally, the reason why you don't care about alpha in linear quantum mechanics is because, as we said earlier, if h chi solves the equation, so does alpha h chi, right? So the value of alpha does not affect your quantum evolution of chi itself. So here you might try to play a game by basically saying, can I somehow take this expectation value and divide this out by some operator in my universe so that I can artificially boost up this effect? That would be the correspondent statement about me conditioning myself to be in this world. Can you do that? Of course, you can't do that because this operator that you write, try to put in the denominator, which is supposed to boost up your effects, is fundamentally non-local, right? Because what's living out here is, envir is the environmental degrees of freedom. The environment is fundamentally not a local object. So in local field theory, you can't construct a sensible operator that can live in the denominator to boost up your effects. So I would say that no matter what you try to do, if you want to get a causal local nonlinear quantum mechanical theory, you will always be tremendously sensitive to cosmology, okay? What the universe chose to place alpha and beta to be. So it's, you can see it very clearly in our theory, but I think it's a generic feature of nonlinear quantum mechanics. Not only that, nonlinear quantum mechanics is going to be even more delicate in crazy ways. So suppose it is a case that the, the Almighty was kind to me, right? The Almighty said, look, this guy's not all bad. Let's make him alpha order one. Beta is very small. Suppose that's even the case, okay? So the universe is such that, you know, uh, uh, the state of the universe is basically our world. We are the entire state of the universe. And suppose we have an experimentalist, let's call them O, okay? And let's say on July the 6th, which I guess it was when I made the slide, uh, they perform an experiment, this particular experiment, by turning on spin up, okay? They send the light, light goes to the top and, uh, you know, and spin down, uh, light goes over here. They perform this experiment. They discover nonlinear quantum mechanics. They're extremely happy, okay? 
But as a good experimentalist, they want to go test this result. They want to be like, let me be absolutely sure before I go around calling the New York Times and saying, I've communicated with another universe, right? Let me make sure the result is actually right. So they want to repeat the experiment. Let's think about the issues that come up in trying to repeat this experiment. So when I perform this experiment, right? The state of the universe is one over square root of two, you know, spin went up and uh, uh, the observer in this case also thought the spin went up. Spin went down, the observer thought that spin went down. But the following thing is possible, right? So O wants to repeat the experiment. Now, in this state where the spin turned on, the spin was up, right? Suppose it is the case that the observer decides to repeat the experiment at 9 a.m. on July the 20th, uh, on July 10th, he just decides to do that, right? He had coffee, whatever, he wants to do this. But well, legitimately, this other guy, spin down guy, is the same observer, by the way, right? Decides that in that world, he's going to run the experiment at 9 a.m. on July the 20th. In, this, the, in the same lab, everything is the same, but just on different dates, vastly different dates. Let us ask what the size of the nonlinear effect actually is, right? So but this guy runs the experiment at 9 a.m. on July the 10th. So what he did was he initially did this, he was extremely happy, and then he decided to split the universe again by doing spin up and spin down and seeing what he got. So the state of the universe at 9 a.m. on July the 10th is going to be this particular combination where spin up, spin up, and in that world, I split the universe again on July the 10th, but the guy in spin down did nothing at all that day. That's a prediction of linear quantum mechanics. So now you go ahead and calculate the expectation value of the electromagnetic field, okay? There's some algebra. The bottom line is basically that what you're gonna find is that because your states are normalized, and because this part of the wave function no longer created the electromagnetic fields on July the 10th, the expectation value will be one half of, of what it used to be, right? Because a part of your wave function is no longer creating the electromagnetic fields over there. So this is extremely important because we're talking about the fact that I really care about position X. I really care about the state of the quantum field at position X, okay? Which means X is very important as, and that means I need to create the full state at that time. I just can't have parts of my state hanging out and doing something different because that would just lead to loss of the effect itself. So that's strange. But of course, it's not something that is a logically required aspect of the story. If you're trying to do this experimentally, what it means is the fact that the experimentalist, when he's trying to create a protocol to test his effect, better make sure that forever on, moving forward, that the two parts of his wave function are always talking to each other so that if both these guys repeat the same experiment on July the 10th at 9 a.m., right? They, if, they, if they again did it on July the 10th at 9 a.m., the effect was exactly back to full strength because the electromagnetic fields are exactly back where they need to be. So nonlinear quantum mechanics is just, so we call this phenomenon quantum pollution, okay? It is the fact that nonlinear effects care about the coefficient alpha, can't do much about that. And if they care about the coefficient alpha and they care about the full state, which is again required uh, for have a unitary theory, it is unavoidable that you have to worry about this phenomenon of quantum pollution because otherwise you will continuously keep losing the effect, right? So this actually brings another very, very important question, which is the statement that, look, particles have been scattering with each other for the last 13 billion years. Every time a particle scatters, the world splits. In other words, the particle scatters, you end up creating an entangled state. And every one of these entangled states is basically is this very complicated linear superposition. And if it is the case that anytime I create a complicated linear superposition, I'm going to start diluting the quantum mechanical effects. Is it possible that you could have essentially just ended up getting some sort of a cosmological relaxation, if you will, of nonlinear quantum mechanics? So the theory could have been fundamentally nonlinear. But just the scattering of particles could have come up with such an incredibly complicated quantum state, okay? That just through dynamic evolution, it becomes, a, it becomes a case that your part of the world, but I'm standing here and talking to you right now, is a very, very small part of the overall state of the universe, which means whatever field that I'm trying to create in the laboratory 
gets weighed down by the small part of the wave function that I'm in? Could that happen dynamically? Is that possible? Okay. So let's think about what matters for the story and what does not matter. Right? So what kinds of splitting of the wave function is relevant and what kinds of splitting are not relevant? So what is relevant is the statement that when you take a superposition, right, any nonlinear quantum mechanical effect where the expectation values of the fields are very different. Like this was the example that I gave earlier, where one experiment is done at 9 a.m., the other one is done at 10 a.m., right? That is a situation where the expectation value of the field is dramatically different. And that would, of course, cause dilution of nonlinear quantum mechanical effects. What is irrelevant, though, is anything that does not actually change the expectation value in a significant way. So, for example, in this version of the experiment, let's say I turned the spin on at 9 a.m. in both the worlds, the lasers were on, the, the expectation value of the electromagnetic field was the same. But let's say in this world, okay, some atom came and scattered with something here. And in this world, this atom came and scattered with something there. But as long as those scatterings did not actually change the actual expectation value of the electromagnetic field, that sort of dilution is okay. Even though your world is split and become you know, complicated, the expectation value is the same in all those complicated splittings, that does not matter, okay? So fundamentally, the kinds of splits that matter are what we would call quantum amplifiers, something where a single quantum event somehow dramatically changed the outcome of a system. That would be very dangerous for nonlinear quantum mechanics, but a garden variety scattering that happens all the time when we talk, that doesn't necessarily change these things all that much. So we're going to consider the following question. Okay. Suppose, as I said, the universe was kind to me and basically placed the entire universe in this quantum state. Okay. So that's what I call the classical state. So this is not inflationary cosmology. We'll talk about inflation in a second. So suppose it is the case that the perturbations that produced our world today are completely classical. Okay. So there are some, at time t equal to zero, there is some state of the world that's completely classical. Is it the case? I grant you that, okay, my wish. Does time evolution inevitably lead me to a world where most of the world, I'm still here giving this conversation, having this conversation, and there's only a very small part of the entire state of the, of the universe where something dramatically different happens? That is one possible time evolution possibility. Or is it the case that no matter what, even if I gave you a completely classical beginning of the universe, or the states are completely classical to start with, time evolution will automatically always result in a situation where the place where I'm standing right now and giving you the stock is a very small part of the wave function. Dynamics that we know about will automatically mean in most of the wave function, I am not standing here right now. Which of these is true, okay? So what is fundamentally required is quantum events such as scattering, decay, et cetera, need to lead to wildly different classical outcomes. It's of course clearly possible. It's not like there's something about dynamics that prevents this from happening, right? Because all of these spin experiments were examples of that, where depending upon spin going up or down, I can dramatically do very different things. So clearly it is possible that quantum events can lead to dramatically different classical outcomes. But that is because humans, obviously now that we have engineers of some sort, can naturally act as quantum amplifiers. The question is, is the universe automatically a natural quantum amplifier? Do single quantum events dramatically lead to drastically different classical evolution in our world? And of course, there are hints of this, for example, in chaotic systems, right? In a chaotic system, a small change to an initial condition would lead to a dramatically different classical outcome. So how do we think about this, right? The key point, is that if I want to think about any classical system and I want to ask how large of a perturbation in this classical system would I need in order to get chaotic behavior, something dramatically different happening from initial condition, you can think about it in the following way. Suppose your classical system contains a very, very large number of particles. It is a case that I have to coherently change the behavior of let's say N atoms in order to dramatically alter the behavior of this classical system. So the canonical example would be the butterfly effect, where a butterfly flaps its wings and there's a typhoon in, tai in Taiwan or whatever. 
So in that case, what we're talking about is that a butterfly has something like a you know, centimeter squared wing size and a millimeter, whatever thing it goes up and down by. So typically in this enormous atmosphere, it is a case that you have to coherently alter the states of, let us say, 10 to the 15 atoms, roughly, up and down for this butterfly to actually cause a uh, typhoon in, in, in Taiwan. But here's the key point, right? Quantum scattering means with probability P, where P is some order one number, all kinds of possible things happen. How likely are you know, N events to coherently happen? Like all, so you require essentially scattering where all the 10 to the 15 atoms quantum mechanically scatter and they all go exactly down, right? That is very, very unlikely. Okay, sorry, I keep hitting this up. So I would say even, with the, even if you have to just change the uh, effect of like 100 atoms, right? Those probabilities that they all coherently move in one way go as P to the 100. And for typical butterfly effects you can think about in classical chaotic systems, N is obviously much bigger than 100. So I would claim that the standard classical chaotic systems you think about are actually quantum mechanically very stable. They undergo chaotic behavior because of classical dynamics, not quantum dynamics. And we know that because as experimentalists, we've been working very hard in the last decade or so to come up with quantum amplifiers, right? Because we want to see dark matter, we want to see infrared photons, whatever it is, we know quantum amplifiers are extremely hard. Single quantum events cannot dramatically change the outcome of large classical systems. It takes a lot of work. So there's reasonable reasons to think that, look, if the universe was somehow started off in a classical state, right? Time evolution would largely reproduce the observed world, by which I mean, in most of the universe, the sun is where it is, the earth is what it is, and all that stuff is still exactly the same. But you're not talking here about a multiverse. You're talking about this many worlds. Many worlds. Right? Yes. Because you're not talking about how big either means. No. So when I call it the multiverse, I'm just simply saying my quantum state is me having this conversation with you. And, but it is true in quantum mechanics, right? I can, I can take this world, put an alpha in front of it, and put a beta where right now this part of space time is empty. Yeah, but, but does that make the question? Can we actually, I mean, how can you tell that there's this other wave function? That there's this other well, in linear quantum mechanics, you cannot. Yeah. But in linear quantum mechanics, you can. And I would argue that, uh, see, the thing is, right, the only consistent way to think about quantum mechanics is through many worlds, mm -hmm. interactions and all these kinds of stuff, which means there is no way you can avoid talking about the full state of the, of the world, because even though that doesn't matter for the linear terms, for nonlinearity, it absolutely does. Right. So you're saying that the, if you introduce the nonlinearity, yeah. it's actually going to be sensitive. Correct. Correct, correct. Okay. So even though, quote unquote, natural, yes. Yeah, so given that you put the momentum, I'm uh, sorry, uh, spatial uh, states of various kinds of motion, right? Even the scattering itself already a quantum amplifier that uh, you know, the scattering have many different possibilities in each of the major points, right? So that implies uh, they automatically couple from the point. No, no, so I wouldn't say automatically. So I would say, yeah, if you're scattering, you're absolutely right that the world will split in many different ways. But even all those worlds, if say the uh, state of the atoms that make up gen are roughly the same, the expectation value of that field would roughly be the same, which means the nonlinear effects would be perfectly large. Uh, okay, can you define roughly the same? What, I'm not identical particles in different... Uh... No, no, so in the sense that, so yeah, one can talk about what, what, what would be called say quantum spread, right? So, the, so it would be the fact that perhaps in some of these scattered worlds, Zen's position is a little bit different, right? So essentially this now comes down to your experimental sensitivity, where I mean like largely, like my picture would be the fact that if you sort of roughly look at it, you'll be like, yeah, you know, in, uh, I take my full quantum state, the expectation of the electromagnetic field is roughly the same. I understand, so yeah. you're, you're saying, even though scattering itself yes. has many different results. Yes. The principle is split a lot, but there's a fastness in the state. So it actually reduces the number of- uh, Exactly. So what counts is ultimately just expectation value. Yeah. And as long as the expectation value is the same in all these split things, 
it doesn't really matter. I agree there's a certain effect, but uh, do you have scaling estimations? I saw it's still, right, still most of the scattering wouldn't be, uh, uh, wouldn't be a, a log amplifier. Each of them generically is amplifier, but given the final ensemble- It is not. Like each other, there's a reduction of the- That's right, that's right. Independent- That's right. Uh, many words, but there, there, there's a reduction, but I, I, I already effectively split the- yeah, yeah, so it's not exactly so it's not the splitting that matters right it's basically as you're saying it is the final result so when uh, you take this entire split complicated thing and you ask well what's the expectation value that's it and uh, you know if that expectation value doesn't change very much it doesn't matter yeah but i do expect it, it, it changes a lot right you're saying no you're saying i only by introducing chaos uh, chaos exactly yeah I guarantee you they're wrong yeah, so exactly, right? So if, if it's only in chaotic systems that a small perturbation like whether an atom went this way or that way will lead to a dramatic change to the outcome. And then a chaotic system, I'd basically be like, well, what is the largest value of the perturbation that you need? Quantify that in terms of the number of atoms that you need to change. And, you know, the key point is this, right? Because essentially any change is some probability to the nth power. And, as, and the probability is always less than one. So if n is even like 100, that just gets killed. And typically it is much bigger. But there are examples okay, where uh, even though the broad dynamics of the world would have led to a world where everything is broadly classical, we are, the earth is where it is, the planets are where they are, et cetera, uh, it is possible that there could be quantum amplification in biology. Okay? And uh, so maybe, I don't know, right? Uh, uh, maybe evolution is so sensitive to some cosmic ray process, who knows, right? that the first RNA in this world required some quantum event. People mumble about this. I have no specific uh, opinion about this field, uh, but there's a field called quantum biology and I just want to think about it, right? Is it possible? So this would be a situation where we would say, again, this is not the nonlinear quantum mechanical theory. This is linear quantum mechanics. If biology happened to be very sensitive to quantum dynamics, you could have started with a world where the perturbations were completely classical. That was my initial point, that evolution broadly led to the planets, the earth, the sun, all of them being exactly at this current location with some tiny spread between them, but on the surface of this planet, okay? Simultaneously, there could be our world where I'm standing here in this particular evolutionary state, but the majority of the superposition may be some dramatically different quantum state, whether there are goats or whatever, crocodiles everywhere, right? It all depends upon this highly complicated evolution. Okay, the question is, can you do something about it, right? Are all of my tests subject to me being a large part of the wave function or not? That's the question. So it will certainly dilute the kind of laboratory effect we're talking about, right? Like if I turn on a laser, even though the earth and sun, everything else is at the same location, if most of the world is cows, I'm going to be losing out on my laboratory experiment. And this is just coming from linear quantum mechanics, not from nonlinearity. The most dramatic of these things is inflation. Quantum amplifiers I claimed are very hard, except in cosmic inflation. In cosmic inflation, inflation rapidly places the quantum state of the universe, okay, in this bunch Davies vacuum, which is a homogeneous and isotropic state. And from that homogeneous and isotropic state, we evolve our world. Of course, our world is not homogeneous and isotropic. I mean, locally, this is dramatically different, all these kinds of things. But what it actually means is that if you look at inflationary cosmology, it is in fact the case that if I take the expectation value of some field, that expectation value will basically be homogeneous and isotropic in the sense that if I look at our world, at this point in X, what I'm talking to you, in the inflationary cosmology, in most of the universe, this is in the middle of empty space. That's just what people who believe in inflation believe. So in inflationary cosmology, right? If I compute these expectation values, the place where I'm standing here and giving a talk is an exponentially small part of the overall superposition of the state. And if inflation was the origin of our world, of quantum perturbations, then no matter what, I can't actually lose this exponential factor there. Impossible, right? So this is a fundamental problem with nonlinear quantum mechanics in the sense that it's not, a, it's not a logical problem, it's just a problem of how to test it, where I would say these nonlinear effects that we're talking about since they care about the full quantum state, okay, it is unavoidably tied to the, in some sense, unchangeable initial 
states of the universe, how the world came in is fundamental to how these effects can be probed. So we're gonna consider three scenarios and I'm sorry for having gone way over time, but maybe another 15 minutes and I'll be done. I'll talk about three kinds of experiments that we can, we can do where we talk about the classical universe. This is the first picture that I talked about where in most of the universe, I'm standing here and giving this talk. And you know you can think about it as warm inflation, et cetera, as providing an origin of these guys. Then there's quantum biology, where most of the world is still the same, the sun, the earth, all these things are where they are. On the surface of the earth, the quantum state is extremely complicated. And there's canonical inflation, where our world is an exponentially small part of the overall state of the universe. So let's think about constraints and tests of these scenarios. Let's start with the most promising one, which is the classical universe, right? So let's begin with this question. People assert that quantum mechanics has been extremely well tested, right? In atomic systems, nuclear systems, et cetera. First of all, you know, no such test exists if we are in an inflationary universe because all of those results will be zero. So let's even talk about the classical effect, right? The classical world. So let's talk about the, that means I'm assuming most of the universe, the atoms are exactly where they are. We are standing here, we're doing this computation. So let's look at the, uh, you know, lamp shift, which is the uh, separation between the 2s and the 2p levels, okay? They have different charge distribution. And as we talked about, they will in fact give rise to different uh, values of the electromagnetic field. They should give rise to level splitting. And this has been measured to extraordinary accuracy, right? The, the lamp shift. But here's a fundamental fact. When we normally find the energy levels of hydrogen, what we do is that we decouple the center of mass motion of the proton from the, uh, I mean, we, we sort of go into center of mass coordinates, right? Where you decouple the center of mass motion of the system from the motion of the relative coordinates. The energy of the system is the relative coordinates. So that's what we calculate, okay? So, but now think about the nonlinear effect. I take the hydrogen atom and if the proton was at a fixed location, I completely agree. There would be a very large correction to the lamp shift. But the proton, let us say, is not fixed to a point. When I'm trying to measure the lamp shift in the, the laboratory, the proton is spread over some trap of, let's say, size 100 nanometers. All of my effects are basically coming from the expectation value of the electromagnetic field. So when I take the proton and I spread it over 100 nanometers, this expectation value automatically gets dramatically diluted. In fact, it's mostly zero because the atom is neutral. So you're going to find that in a neutral atom, even if the coupling was fundamentally large, all of these effects are tremendously suppressed except at some edges. And in fact, the bound on epsilon is something like 10 to the minus two, which really comes from some tests using ions where the shifts are not quite that, that badly suppressed. Okay. So similarly, people claim you have tested quantum mechanics through uh, nuclear physics. But once again, the nuclei, if, I would agree, if you fix them to a point and you do these tests, you will find large effects. But a nucleus typically is sitting in some lattice, it's spread over some distance, and all these effects will get diluted by the fact that the nuclear wave function is now spread over a large distance. Okay. So the leading constraint in the scenario really just comes from some accidental things. People have, for example, managed to trap ions in a trap. When you trap ions in a trap, if the self interaction is repulsive, the ion would repel itself. And that would have prevented you from trapping it. So that puts a limit of epsilon 10 to the minus five on these scenarios. Uh, there are no direct limits on the attractive case, right? Nobody's done it. Uh, 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 we can ignore that comment later on. Okay. So uh, 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 let us see quickly what kinds of experiments we can actually do to test these things. So I'm talking about three experiments that are actually happening right now. Okay, so the key point is that we're going to create a macroscopic superposition and use that macroscopic superposition to test for these effects. Okay, so the first kind of experiment that, 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 that my friend Alex Sushkov is doing at Boston University right now is that uh, you take a spin, you see, you measure the spin, you get spin up or spin down. And depending upon the outcome, you're going to do some kind of magnetic field measurement. Basically, you have a squid, and essentially what you do is the following let's say, uh, uh, the spin was up at time t and t plus dt, you turn on a magnetic field. And at time t plus dt and t plus 2 dt, you turn off the magnetic field. When the spin is down, you do the opposite. And what you're seeing is that 
let's say I turned on the spin in this world, okay? So the magnetic field was on over here. Then Alex Sushkov in this world, at the same time, where his magnetic field was off, he's trying to see if a squid will see a magnetic field. There's a communication between the walls. That's something you can do, okay? You can do similar tests with gravity as well. So my friend Jason Hogan is gonna do this, where basically you do a spin flip, and depending upon this, he will either bring a one ton set of bricks next to his accelerometer. So you take a bunch of bricks, say one ton in mass, you put that next to an, to, to an, to an accelerometer, and you basically ask, well, uh, uh, you know, spin up the bricks are nearby, spin down the, the, the bricks are far away. So in the world where you got spin down, you basically ask in your accelerometer, are you seeing the gravity of the uh, spins in the, uh, uh, from the other wall? There's another test, which is basically uh, being performed right now by Hartmut Hafner at Berkeley. And uh, this is a much more classic one where you take an ion interferometer, you split its path, okay? And you split its path and then you recombine them. In normal quantum mechanics, it is the case that this, uh, uh, when you take this ion, you split it, this part of the wave function does not feel the other part of the wave function, right? So these two guys are not gonna interact with each other. So there is no phase shift in an ion interferometer that depends upon how much of the splitting actually happens. In this case, there would be because if I made, you know, this thing P and this is square root of one minus P square, depending upon how much of the wave function lives here, that guy will feel this. So that is again, something you can actually do right now and it's being done right now. So those are the classical experiments. Let me rapidly tell you about the thoughts we have about the quantum biology version. So this is the version where in most of the universe, the world is exactly where, where we are and uh, except on the surface of the earth, biology has made something extremely complicated, okay? So the large scale structure of the universe is going to be dramatically the same, but local structures, for example, buildings, et cetera, are very different in this universe. So what we can do in this case is basically we can go and look for things that should exist in most of this world. So the, the, the best experiment I think is a statement that you, uh, like for this as per this particular scenario is concerned, in most of the state of the universe, the magnetic field of the world is exactly what it is. The earth is still here, the magnetic fields are exactly what they are. So then you go and build a shield. That shield of course only exists in your universe, right? It doesn't exist in the universe of the cows. And then, but the expectation value of the magnetic field is now visible to everybody. So you go inside a shielded room and try to see a magnetic field of the earth inside that shielded room. So you can do that, okay? So for gravity, we spe speculate perhaps you can go look for gravitational effects of waves in a man-made uh, island. So for example, there are islands that we have built in our world, which don't exist in the world of the cows. So you can go with a gravimeter and sit on an island that you, that you built in your world and try to see if you're seeing effects of waves from the other parts of the wave function. What about the inflationary case, which naively is the most dramatic one, where you say our world is in the middle of basically the vast majority of the universe. Uh, our world is in the middle of nowhere, okay? So one thing you can actually do with that case is basically you can look for effects of cosmic rays once again inside shields. So in most of the universe, this point in space is empty space which means there should be cosmic rays coming in, high energy protons, things of that sort. So what you can go and look for is, for example, you go to Ice Cube and you ask them, well, they saw a high energy event, let us say, or some event, do they know that it was not a proton? Because a proton, of course, can't dig through a kilometer of ice. The only way that could have come in is because from the other world, there was a little bit of proton current sitting in there, which was able to excite something. And uh, 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 of course, uh, the, the, the most dramatic effect is basically the statement that uh, if you think about it, even in this uh, universe where most of the universe was uh, this inflationary world where you know, we are in the middle of empty space, right? The metric is a operator that always has a non-zero expectation value, no matter what Schiffman might claim, right? So that's an actual fact. The metric is non-zero, which means what can happen is a statement that in our world, we can see effects of the interference of this metric on our world. So our metric that we are moving on is not just our metric, it would could, it could contain expectation value of G mu nu. And the point is the expectation value of G mu nu is non-zero. So you're going to now get, if you will, effects from the other world affecting your gravitational phenomenon. Okay, 
So we actually, uh, 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 in the interest of time, I won't go into this too much. We're still working through all these kinds of effects. But basically, the idea is that this is the sort of thing that you could actually test using strong field tests of GR, where basically you realize that, oh my God, my particles are not falling like the way they're supposed to. I'm actually seeing the effects of some other metric coming in here and messing me up. Okay. So uh, it's possible to also solve the black hole information problem. I won't get into that right now. Uh, with that, let me actually conclude. So really what we are working on right now is just those final aspects of the story. What we're basically saying, let me take the inflationary possibility very seriously. Let me realize that the interference of the metrics is a non-trivial phenomenon. Can we use this to test this scenario in strong field GR? Can we use this to uh, solve the black things of the black hole information problem? That's basically how, uh, where we are right now. So with that, let me stop. Yeah. Um, question. So, from what I understand, you are looking at the effects of this non uh, because of nonlinearity. You're getting some. Um, your universe is in a. Your system is in a mixed state. Yes. One one of the states is something you expect from our, our universe and linear quantum mechanics, and there's a part which you don't. No, no, no. I would say it's not a mixed state in the sense that I would say there's. I mean, there's only a pure state here, right? Which is basically our world, plus beta times the other world. Yeah, but in our world, we see it as a mixed state. But the point is, when we are looking at the whole world, like yes. our universe and a different universe, yes. this could just be arising from some interaction between the two universes. Right? Correct. So it interaction with just not uh, linear quantum mechanics with no non-linearity, right? No, no, no. It is interaction between different parts of the quantum state, right? So that's the crucial point here. Yes, this is. For example, uh, just the very basic measurement in linear quantum mechanics that we talk about. You yes. Could, you get these effects just because we are not observing a certain part of the system, right? And in linear quantum mechanics, you can never observe those parts of the system. Yeah, we are not observing those parts of the system, but my system will still be in a, such a mixed state that we end up with in nonlinear quantum mechanics at all. No, 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 no. Yeah, it is true that in nonlinear quantum mechanics, you will get entangled in this particular way. Yeah. And in linear quantum mechanics, that entanglement prevents you from ever knowing about the other state, yeah. right? I will never know about the other universe. Yes. But my system will still have effects from that universe, which not in linear quantum mechanics. Differentiate, but there will be those effects. Not in linear quantum mechanics. No, but I guess I guess what he's saying is that I have an effect from this nonlinear quantum mechanics being mimicked by linear some, theory. Yes, some linear, linear theory, interactions. Interaction, no. Interaction. No. Yes, exactly. It can't be. It can't be. Right? Because specifically, this thing they're talking about, right? That basically you could do this experiment where, let's say, I uh, in a causal theory, no. Okay. So uh, I, I, I say with spin up, right? I basically send, I shoot a laser to the top and I expect to get uh, in the world where the spin was down, right? I'm supposed to be getting a, uh, I, 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 and then basically I go to, to this side and I ask, is my photo detector getting hot or not, right? So that's a macroscopic system where in linear quantum mechanics, you have entangled yourself in a very complicated way with an enormous environment. There is no way that in linear quantum mechanics, you'll, you'll ever be able to get rid of that entanglement. No, but even in linear quantum mechanics, we can have, let's say, a third universe where we are doing some combination of the spin states, not up or down, but some intermediate states. Is it the case that in linear, so the moment you create this entanglement between this, this laser and this environment, there's an enormous number of degrees of freedom, right? It is impossible for you to remove that entanglement to see the effects of the splitting. Right, you have to come up with a system where it's, see, this is the thing, right? You have to, in linear, to see the effects of linear quantum mechanics, you have to work extremely hard to maintain quantum coherence. I'm not talking about quantum coherence. In no, but that's the only way you will actually be able to sense any effect of the other world in linear quantum mechanics. I don't know. If yes. there are interactions, we will be able to see them. No. Like, for example, I guess what you're saying is that maybe there's some weird interaction. Exactly. Like, uh, you had like a. Hot, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so, the, like you had an, um, where you described, uh, where you uh, first introduced many body interpretation, you had like a system interacting with a difference, like a small system interacting with a bigger system. Yes. And we make uh, measurements on the bigger system. Yes. It is because of these. Uh, interactions in linear quantum mechanics that our system, our smaller system is affected itself, right? That's what you have. It is true that our interactions will change these systems. Yeah. But the point is if you want to, in linear quantum mechanics, right? If you want to get some 
effect of this other world that simultaneously exists, yes. you would have to remove, you, you need an, a non-zero inner product between this state and our state. If you don't have a non-zero inner product, you will get zero. And to create that non-zero inner product you, is extremely difficult, right? Because you've now entangled yourself in a very complicated way with a macroscopic system. So I don't see how you would physically remove it. Like in a sense, if I turned on this laser and it's bent that way, you can do it. Now, Tony asked me some of a slightly different version of this question. Well, I was gonna ask you that question after him actually. Yeah. yeah, so the version of the question you're asking is basically, can I mock this up with some BSM physics? Yeah, that's my question I was gonna ask. Exactly, exactly. So you can't do this in a, in a once again in this, uh, so take this example of Alex Sushkov, right? Where okay. basically I know when I'm turning on my magnetic field, right? So in time, I can separate my events. So in one world, I turn on the event, let's say at 10 a.m. The other world, I'm gonna do that at next year at 10 a.m. But if the worlds are talking to each other, I will now, in the, in the other world where I'm supposed to have not done anything for a year, I will still see an effect now, right? So it's very, yeah, so you, I mean, maybe in a non-local way you can do that, uh, but not in any causal theory that I can see. Yeah. yeah, so you can separate these effects both in time and space that way. Sociological sure. Sociological, yes. Because I'm uh, experimental, right? Yes. Uh, quantum mechanics. Oh, okay. I want to test quantum mechanics on its non-energy form. So I want to set up my experiment in many different forms. Why does I, why do I need to be motivated by the particular way you're writing down the non-energy vector? Or I just go ahead and do my experiment? Well, good. So first of all, I would say that uh, this field of nonlinear quantum mechanics does not actually exist. Right? There's not a whole lot of work done on this. So uh, the history of this field is that basically Weinberg wrote something up in the 1980s. And he went and told people, go and make measurements of atomic systems very carefully. Now Weinberg messed up because his modification was actually not causal in the first place. And this is key because if you think about it, right? Atomic systems are terrible places to measure nonlinear quantum mechanics because the atomic wave functions are always going to be spread out. Weinberg in analyzing his nonlinearity secretly assumed that you could do what we always do in linear quantum mechanics, which is, which is to do a center of mass separation and only care about that. In a causal theory, you cannot do that. The reason is the following, right? In a causal theory, you care about X, right? X matters. And so, and in the nonlinear theory, the coefficient of the nonlinearity matters. So if I take the, any atomic test, not just what I'm talking about, just in general, whatever Weinberg might have in mind, if I take an atom and I spread that over a one meter box, right? Weinberg would have said, oh, the nonlinear effect should be large. But no, they can't be because the wave function is now diluted over one meter because X matters, which means any nonlinear effect you're looking at will be automatically suppressed. Okay, so this is, so this is an unfortunate thing in the sense that many experimentalists spend time looking for Weinberg's modification and they were just wasting their time because uh, the theory was incorrectly analyzed. So then you can ask, why is my theory any better than some other theory? Well, I don't know of any other theory in the first place. And uh, the reason why I'm happy with this theory, that's a better way of putting it, is the fact that I can see how this very naturally fits into quantum field theory, right? So many people do this. They start by trying to write down the Schrodinger equation and try to modify Schrodinger's equation in some nonlinear way. The problem in doing that is that it's always been the same thing. The problem has always been, how do I describe separated systems that are entangled with each other, right? Because here's the issue. I take two systems, I entangle them, and I take the other guy and I go to Mars. And then I do something on the guy in Mars. In a nonlinear world, psi squared is multiplying, is, 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 is sort of sitting in there and trying to mess with your system. The question becomes, how do you describe this entangled state? In linear quantum mechanics, sorry, in, in, in Schrodinger equation, right? There is no obvious way to do that because Schrodinger equation is a single particle story. So what I would say is that if you are trying to solve a problem of causality and you are trying to solve a problem that involves separated systems, field theory is the natural starting point because field theory is designed to, have, to handle those problems. And uh, what I can see is that there is nothing that obstructs me from writing down these modifications in the, uh, you know, Schrodinger equation for field theory. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Yeah. But then we are going, coming to the very first question. So what's non-relativistic limit? Can I, is it possible to come up with some? Yeah. 
system with a finite dimensional field grid space where everything can be analyzed. Well, I would say this particular modification is tied to field theory in the sense that the, the nonlinear interactions are fundamentally tied to quantum fields. So you can write down, let's say, in just an effective theory where you might basically say, yes, if I have a single electron and I want to understand what is the Schrodinger equation for a single electron around a proton, you can do that. I d psi dt is equal to this h naught psi plus this integral that we talked about. I, I can put you that, I, I can give you that slide. This will tell you what it is. Uh, where, where is the thing here? Oh. oh, it's here, it's here. So this is the very beginning of my slides there. Oh, sorry, I, I moved wrong direction. Yeah, so that's just it, right? So for a single particle, what you're gonna do is basically you're gonna say, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that's my state, single particle. Do the standard procedure that you do to go from field theory to single particle quantum mechanics. Yeah, I'm not happy with this default x, right? Because this means that uh, your contraction is uh, intrinsically resistant. No, you can make it trivially sort of uh, in the large C limit, which is a statement that you basically say, look, I'm going to ignore effects that have to do with time, right? That basically means that you just say, look, this basically becomes a Green's function x as opposed to time. So there's a standard way in which you take a Green's function in time and space and the, and the large C limit, you just make it into a instantaneous Green's function in space. But then you can't really ask me about causality because of course uh, you've taken the limit where C is uh, infinity. Uh, but then you can just do that. because th th That will then simply reproduce, D, uh, this becomes psi squared X. This X is of course space, uh, psi X of course space. And that becomes the Green's function in space. Like, so that becomes one over X minus X prime but x minus x prime are spatial vectors. And, and that would be the, uh, the number of this equation. Version, yes. And no one ever guessed that? Uh, if there were a couple of these. Uh, they... It would be hard to guess, right? If you didn't start from the field. Theory. Yes. They didn't do it, yeah. So actually, uh, yeah, go on, yeah. You mentioned this spin experiment. Yes. Austin University, right? Yes. Um, which outcome will lead us to do uh, this nonlinear theory? Both outcomes. Um, like, what should we uh, observe so that uh, we no. should think about nonlinear? Yeah. So what? So, so basically, what they're going to do is, you know, let's say 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. They turn on. Uh, they do the spin measurement. So they got spin up at 10 a.m. They turn on a magnetic field mm -hmm. and in one world. In spin down, they turn on the magnetic field at 10.05. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to see is basically uh, in, in the world where uh, spin was down, Alex is going to go at 10.05 and ask, oh, is there a magnetic field there or not? Mm -hmm. Right? If he sees the magnetic field when he shouldn't be seeing one, that will be the indication that there is not an quantum mechanics. Do the experiment or they're building it right now so they won't quite do magnetic fields in the first version because i guess magnetic fields and squids are a pain to deal with they're going to do an uh, a capacitor version where basically depending upon the outcome of a spin uh, at some time t you either decide to charge up a capacitor or don't charge it and then you have a little voltmeter that you're going to try to read out and uh, what you want to try and see is basically uh, in this uh, at different times are the volt are the voltmeter reacting or not if they don't observe any uh, nonlinearity, then can you still conclude that uh, in such a way these nonlinear fields are suppressed because of the uh, dilution? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a possibility, right? So, uh, in a sense, if you ask experimentally, what are we actually testing, mm -hmm. right? In this story, I can't just test for epsilon alone. Mm -hmm. I got to test for the combination of epsilon times what I believe the world is, right? So uh, what Alex is testing for is the assumption that the world is dominantly us. Mm -hmm. If the world was inflationary in the origin, even if epsilon was order one, Alex's experiment would see zero. So that is this version that I didn't talk about very much at the end, which is a statement that in those cases, what you want to do are look for effects on the metric itself. Because the, what you want, right? Like essentially, 
what does this mean? It basically means that I, I, the tests that I have in mind are always tied to what is the largest contribution to the expectation value of whatever operator I'm looking at. Now, most operators will have zero expectation value, except for the metric, right? Or the Higgs, for example. So the expectation value of the metric is something that you can very reasonably expect would be non-zero in these other worlds. And then you can basically ask, well, is that expectation value something I can go and measure somewhere? The problem is I can't change it easily in the lab because I don't control it. But if it's there, I can go and ask how our body is moving under it. And I would predict a deviation from the GR prediction because there's now a metric that I don't, that is not sourced by my matter. It's this other metric coming in, messing things up. So it's still testable. It's just a lot harder to test. There's a spin experiment. It's the that's the best possibility to actually see something that directly tells you what's going on when you're. Uh, that is the, uh, well, I wouldn't say necessarily, but it's certainly one of the easiest, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, or the ions, uh, you know, all of them. The classical stuff, whether it's like I'm measuring spin, yeah, or the ion interferometer, they're all things that are happening right now. People are already doing them. Uh, the harder ones to do would be this evolutionary biology thingy, right? Where uh, uh, if the world is complicated, then I have to come up with a better way of measuring a magnetic field inside a shielded room or I need to find a man-made island or a man-destroyed island and go and look for uh, you know, uh, 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 waves and stuff like that. Those are kind of harder to do, of course. Uh, uh, so I have not yet pushed on it yet. But what's gonna happen in the lampshade experiment? It seems to me you're just putting a strain on it. That's the one. Ah, yeah, because the lampshade experiment is not very good. Yeah, so, no, no, but I'm saying, but how would I see this effect? Because there was a bunch of epsilon in the lamp. You'd have to somehow come up with a way to localize the proton extremely well. So you have, if you, if you took the proton and you held it, say to an angstrom, right? Then you will see it. Now, of course, the proton is held to an angstrom in a table, but in a table, there's like lots of multi-body effects that will totally ruin any lampshade you can do. So I don't know how you would hold the proton down to a angstrom without interactions. And those interactions that you're going to turn on will then destroy the lamps. Basically, the lamps just put an up and down. Exactly. It is more to say the. It is more to fight the. the it is more to, in a sense, uh, point out that conventional ways in which people think about testing nonlinear quantum mechanics are actually not very sensible. Right. right? Because this is and this is interesting, right? But basically, you say when you normally think about testing quantum mechanics, your mind immediately goes to pristine quantum systems, atomic levels, nuclei, etc realize all of them are pointless. The test actually involves something totally crazy, like not so things like macroscopic effects coming in and you're, you're looking for communication, that kind of thing. So it's a totally different viewpoint you need to have to be testing for nonlinear quantum mechanics. Okay, well, that, uh, any more questions? Yeah, there's one more question. If not, well, let's thank Sergey again. Thank you so much. Oh, it's not my computer, it's your, your computer, right?